Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody as we gather together in our Lord's name. We have a few announcements as we begin. Uh, first of all, today, following our second worship, our second service this morning, we'll be having our voters meeting that will be downstairs in the uh, fellowship hall. So, three times a year. This is the first one of 2020 as we go forward. Uh, a couple of other announcements as well. Uh, the Valentine's Tea will be coming up on Sunday, February 9th. Uh, please sign up on the bulletin wall as you head out in the morning. And uh, that will be following the second service on February 9th. And uh, lastly, this coming week, yes, this week is when we'll be having the pictorial directory pictures taken. 
If you have not yet signed up, please talk to Carol and we'll uh, see what slots might be available here. If you're not able to fit into one of the slots that we have still available, uh, there are slots at other congregations where the same business is taking uh, pictures as well, where you could get them there and the pictures would be into our directory. So there are options as we go forward as well. Are there any other announcements this morning? Let's take a moment to greet one another. Please rise. Good, about you. Tommy, Tommy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There you are. I know. How are you? Good to Mrs. Davis, and how are you this fine night? Yeah, you too, honey. Whoops, excuse me. All right. And how are you, young lady? Good to see you. Leave also us not destitute of your manifold gifts, 
nor of grace to use them always to your honor and glory and the good of others. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we joyfully sing our hymn of praise. Power. 
For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you come forward for the children's message? Should we always talk about Jesus? Yeah, I think we should, right? And throughout this season, called Epiphany, Epiphany kind of where God's showing us a bit of who he is in Jesus. We're going through the different names that Jesus has, the one that's walking with us. What do we call him? And what would be, if you're going to say, going to call Jesus a name, a good name, he's got many names, what name would you call Jesus? Jesus, there we go. Awesome. You're paying attention. Good job, both of you. Excellent. So if we're going to call Jesus by a name, Jesus works with a pretty good name, doesn't it? And in fact, I kind of got a thing up there, and there I have his name, Jesus. And could you tell me what Jesus means? It's those three words under Excellent. Yes, the Lord saves. So Jesus, in Hebrew, is the name Yahshua. Joshua. That's what the Hebrew, you wanted to know that, right? The Hebrew name, right? And now you know it. Did you know you know Hebrew now? Good job. You say Yahshua? There you go. Excellent. That's the Hebrew word that is Jesus' name. And it means he who saves. Now, a guy named Joshua, long time before Jesus, God worked through him and saved him and saved the people of Israel from a lot of the enemies that wanted to get rid of him. So God worked through Joshua to physically save his people. Does God do that to us sometimes now too? Absolutely. Absolutely. He comes to us and he takes care of us a lot of times when we don't deserve it. He takes good care of us as his people. Now, Jesus has the same name. Jesus is the Greek form of it. And so, basically, it means he saves. Now, Jesus, did he only save us physically? He did, but he saved us even more, didn't he? He saved us eternally. Jesus, when he comes to save us, saves us from all our sins, saves us from the power of the devil. And when Jesus saves us, he grabs a hold of us and he says, I save you. And so when we think of what does Jesus' name mean? That's what it means. He saves us eternally. Shall we have a prayer? Let's hold hands. We pray all together. Dear Jesus, dear, dear Jesus, Jesus, thank you for saving Thank you for saving me and pointing that out and pointing that out in your own name, in your own name. In that name we pray, in that name we pray. Amen. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, <coughs> casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat of Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess what our Lord has done for us in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we sing together our servant hymn. And as we sing throughout this hymn, very much is talking about, and what we'll be singing, is what our Lord did with his disciples in calling them and how he led them as his disciples.
strength and redeemer. Amen. As we take this walk along with our Lord, we see this journey as our Lord leads us, guides us, as he walks with us every step of the way. And kind of as we just sang, we see how our Lord was guiding those disciples. We say how Jesus called the twelve, which we very much see in our gospel text for today, as he calls the twelve to follow him. O oh, Christ who taught the twelve, as he let, as he told them, as he shared with them, as he brought them along. O oh, Christ who led the twelve, as he said, now come along, and I will bring you where you need to go. And finally, as Christ then sends the twelve, as he sends them out to do the work, to do the bidding, to share this word, to share what the Lord has done, that more might hear, and more might know their Lord, and more might know their Savior. And we see a lot of kind of an outline of how God leads the disciples. And the second part of each one of those verses is that how the Lord does that same thing with us as he calls us, as he teaches us, as he leads us, and as his chosen people, as he's brought us together, as he sends us where we need to be as his holy people. We can kind of then go, where are we being led? As God is going through all of this, as he's calling us, I'm sure the disciples who then immediately, and it says that way twice there, Jesus calls Peter and immediately he follows. They call more and immediately he follows. And so each step of the way as it goes along, immediately they do what their Lord has told them. They do what their Lord has shared. And they go where he wants them to be. Oh, I knew I was going to forget something. I managed to leave the pointer all the way down here. It's rather difficult to change slides without this. You're then I could have kept pointing at uh, Kevin up there, taking care of everything. But where is he leading us? And as they were going forward and as he was telling them, the first place that he started to lead is he led to Capernaum, to that place by the sea. And as we go through this gospel reading that our Lord has given to us, you can get an image. It's a more, obviously, modern-day view of what is Capernaum. But as we read in Isaiah, and as we read in the gospel lesson, it's called, Caper it's called the way by the sea. And you can kind of see exactly what's going on there. As you've got that small town that's right there by the sea, as it's got on one side, you got the fishing that we all have heard of so many times. And then especially today, as you can see also, then it's got the farming that also takes place. And all along from Galilee going down towards that Red Sea, Dead Sea, you've got all of this farming and growth and fruit and vegetables. And some of the food that you might eat there is just incredible as you're getting all this fresh, good stuff that we see what our Lord has done. But as Jesus is down around Jerusalem area, John the Baptist is arrested. So Jesus then departs from that area because the time was not yet right. Goes up to Nazareth, and the text says that, and then he moved to Capernaum. Now, how much he had to move, I don't know. If anybody here has moved before, you know what that's like. That's a pretty big thing in order to move. After you've stayed in a place 10, 20 years, how much stuff do you accumulate? Plenty. I would wager that we all have a lot more accumulated than what Jesus had to move when he went from Nazareth to Capernaum. But you're also then leaving home. You're also leaving your place. You're going to a new place, a new area. You're leaving behind a lot of what was before and you're moving to a new. And as Jesus goes to this new place, he goes to this place fulfilling the Old Testament scriptures. That's why we had that Old Testament and the Gospel lesson. Because here is talking about OU, Zebulun, Naphtali, 
You were considered a way, less than, smaller, don't care about you. You who are up there that are kind of insignificant, you Gentile area, you area that's away from all of us. You are held in contempt, is the Hebrew word. Out of you will come one. And if we had read just a couple more verses in that Old Testament text, we would have then heard that Christmas words that we often hear. For unto you is born this day. For unto you a child is born. For unto you a son is given. And so all of this that we read before about Zebulun, Nephtali, the land of the Gentiles, up there in Galilee, that's where Jesus goes. You can ask the question, why does he go? Right there is the easy first answer. Why does he go to that place, to that where? To fulfill the Old Testament scriptures. And Matthew is very consistent throughout all of the gospel. He goes forward ten times in a very specific formula. We actually see that formula in our gospel today. Where he says, and Jesus did this. And that is then fulfilled, this part of the Old Testament. The one that we read in our gospel about coming from the land of Naphtali, Zebulun, Galilee, is the fifth time out of ten. So we're right at that halfway mark here, where Jesus does work, does actions, moves to a new way in fulfilling the Old Testament. And in our specific gospel for today, as he goes back to Galilee, fulfilling that promise in Isaiah, seven centuries before, as he goes up and preaches and teaches and shares. And as he goes to kind of what becomes, you could say, his central headquarters, his central area, he goes and he does preaching. He proclaims. He does a lot of healing. He does a lot of preaching. And as he preaches, it tells us that he went to the synagogue in order to preach and to proclaim. Did he do other places? Obviously. We all remember the Sermon on the Plain. If you're out there on a plane, you're not in a synagogue. We all remember his preaching in the temple. We all remember uh, down in the temple. We all remember his preaching, his sermon on the mount. He preached in other areas too, especially once the crowd started to get huge. But right here as he moves to Capernaum, he goes to the synagogue. And this is kind of the remains of the synagogue. Now, the white stuff that's on top there, that's the new synagogue. Brand new, built in the third century. Yeah, you all know I have a weird sense of time. All of the new, new, but it was all built, and you can see this different coloration right there on the bottom. And then it goes right along there. That's the foundation of the original synagogue. That's the foundation of the synagogue, same footprint, right along there, goes all the way around, that Jesus preached in, according to the text that we were given. And one of the fun side notes of knowing that is, according to that tradition, we know right where the Moses seat was, because that's how they built all their synagogues. The Moses seat was where the preacher would sit down and preach to everybody. And if I'm remembering my orientation correctly, it's here, it's right there. The Moses seat would have been right there in that picture, right behind that wall. And then you have to actually go down because it's archaeology. So it would have actually been eh, probably about four feet behind that brick or that stone part of the wall. Right there would have been where, as it said in Capernaum, he was preaching and sharing the word to the people that were gathered around to hear him. Where did he go? He went to Capernaum. He went to the place where the people were. But not only there, he went to the synagogue, he went to where everybody was at, but he didn't stop there. He went and preached in many and various places. But at the very end of our text, it tells us something pretty interesting. Because here you have, he's all the way down there, 
moves up to Capernaum right there. And the people that were coming to hear him were people from up here in Syria. You had people from Judah and Jerusalem down there. You had people, it actually says, from the Decapolis right there. The Decapolis, Deca, ten. You had ten cities that were cities that were created by Alexander the Great. So as Alexander the Great came through, he made ten cities that became ten city-states later on over here. All Gentile cities. So all of those cities were non-Jewish, non-Israelite cities. And the people were flocking to him from the Gentile areas. Now if Jesus had stayed down in Jerusalem, that probably wouldn't have happened. Where did Jesus go as he led his disciples? He led them where the people were. He led them where people of all nations could hear. Sometimes we get this image in our head of Galilee being this backwater place, nobody going there, nobody living up there, just a few people and their goats and a little bit of our carpentry work, things of that nature. You had people from all over gathering together there. From the Gentiles came to hear Jesus. Why did he go up there? Fulfill scripture. Why did he go to Capernaum? So more people, so all the people could hear the word that he was preaching and proclaiming. And it's when those crowds started to come that he couldn't just sit in the synagogue anymore. Because you saw the size of that. You could probably have 100, 150 people there hearing him. But not when you get to the 5,000 men at the feeding of the 5,000. Plus women, plus children. No way are you feeding 12,000 people in that synagogue. So he goes out to the fields, to the mount. He goes out to the Sea of Galilee where people will hear what's going on. He went where the people were. He went and proclaimed where everybody was at as those crowds gathered around to hear. He put himself in a position so everybody could hear. Part of my imagination is that Jesus must have had a pretty good pastor's voice. Because as he's up there, he's preaching and proclaiming, and you're having the thousands hearing him. So my imagination is he had a pretty good voice where everybody could hear this word of what he had to share and what he had to proclaim to all these people gathering around. And the people flocked to him. Some of them to see a prophet, yes. Some of them to hear the word, yes. A lot of them to be healed. And if you remember that gospel reading that we read just a minute ago, you heard it wasn't just, and he healed lots of sick. Could Matthew have said that? He could have. Instead, he goes, so his fame spread. They brought the sick, those of many diseases, many pains, demons, epileptics, paralytics. He healed them. In other words, as Matthew is going forward, he's sharing all these many different kinds, many different ailments of where people were being brought forward to Jesus, and he was healing them. How this exactly happened, we don't have a YouTube video. It could have been something like this, as they were coming to the master, knowing, Lord, heal me, coming to the Lord. And you can almost then imagine the Lord just laying his hand upon the person, maybe putting his hands where they were not, where they needed the help, bringing that healing to them. Why did he do that? So they might hear his word. Why did he do all this healing? Because all of those that were healed, did they get sick again someday? Yes. The two people that Jesus raised from the dead, did they pass away someday? Yes. He healed them. Kind of the same reason why he went to Capernaum. To fulfill scripture and to show who he was. And by showing everybody, my word has this power. They came and heard and listened to what he did. 
Jesus didn't go off to a far off mountain and say, come out here and find me. Jesus didn't go off to an area and say, I'm going to hide in this area with walls and everything. Behind. And if you can really work, you can find me. I know there are some churches that actually, I've heard this from some churches, haven't heard it here at Berea, but I've heard it from some churches where people have said, if they want to find us, they know where we're at. That's not the example. As Jesus was leading and teaching and eventually sending those disciples, was it? Jesus went where the people were. Jesus went where they were at. He didn't sit back behind walls and say, come and find me. He went out to see them and to talk with them. And as he preaches, he goes to where they live. He goes to where they work. He goes to where everybody is at. And here you can kind of see an image of what it might have been like as you're at the city of Capernaum. Because you have a fisherman that would have been there. And they were about their work. In other words, think about it. Could Jesus have preached in the synagogue? Yes, and he did. But he then also went to the Sea of Galilee, just a stone's throw away. And the people came out to hear. Where was it that he was preaching? The fishermen were there. The fishermen were out there throwing their nets just a little ways away to here. The fishermen were over here. They were mending their nets. They were taking care of stuff. They were businessmen. They were going about what needs to take place to keep their business up, to keep things going, to put bread on the table, to take care of what needs to be done. They were about the work that they had in their life. You had the fisher's market right there, where you would take your fish, you would sell the fish, you would take care of it. So think about it. Where was it that Jesus was preaching? In the synagogue, yes. But as he went out, he was in the market. He was in the place of work. He was in the place of business. He was where everybody was living their lives. He didn't only say, over here in the synagogue, you can find me. He went out where everybody was living. He went out where everybody was at. And so as he was there, and they were throwing their nets, you can very much imagine the fishermen, they're within earshot of Jesus as he's there preaching, proclaiming, and you've got the crowd that's there listening to him. In another text, he goes on to one of the boats, goes out a little ways so that everybody can hear him as he's preaching and as he's proclaiming. And you can imagine the fishermen that are about their business as they're mending the nets that got torn during the day, as they might be taking care of their boats, as they're doing their work. They're listening. They're hearing what Jesus is sharing. They're hearing what he's bringing to them. And as Jesus is bringing this, they know what he's saying. That's why in our text, and Matthew uses this very intently as he goes forward. And immediately, now you go to the Gospel of Mark, and when immediately is used, he just uses it all over the place. When you get to Matthew, he intentionally uses immediately, for now there's a change. Something has now just suddenly changed at this point. And we find that word twice in our gospel for today. Jesus comes to Peter and his brother as they're out there in the boat. And he says, come, follow me. And so you can imagine as they're about their work, as they're about their business, listening to him. He says, follow me. Hearing the word, immediately they follow him. Then he walks down just a little ways. And then you've got John, uh, John and James mending their nets, doing the work that needs to be done. Listening in to all of what's going on as this is all happening. And he comes and says, with their dad in the boat, follow me. Probably his dad was okay with it. Because he was there with them, hearing some of the same words Jesus was sharing. And immediately, they follow him. A sudden change happens. They're hearing the word. The word has its impact. And now they go about a new work. 
They had been at work in their business and their fishing. Now, Jesus says, I make you fishers of men. Now I make you my own to follow me. And I will call you. I will teach you. I will lead you. And having walked with them all along that journey, finally, about three years later, he completely sends them out with the Holy Spirit. But he sends them out to do this work, to be fishers of men, to share what God and Jesus Christ had given to them. So with all of that, looking at our text, what does that say for us and our congregation? What was Jesus' example? Jesus went out to where the Gentiles were. Jesus went to the synagogue, yes. He also went to the plains. He also went to the Decapolis. He also talked to the people in Syria. He went out where the people were working. He went out to their lives. Jesus didn't just sit back and say, come and find me. He went out where they were working and living and being. And he brought the gospel to them. What about us? As God has called us, as God has taught us, as God leads us, he also sends us. And as he sends us out, wherever we're at in our life, we bring Christ out there. We don't leave Christ within these buildings and these walls. We do come here, we do hear, we do sing, we're lifted up with one another. Throughout our life, we bring that gospel and we bring that good news to all parts of our life, of our culture, of our nation, and of our world. Amen. And now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Lord, for the many manifold gifts that you have given and granted to us. We thank you for that word that points us to Jesus, who saves us. We thank you for that word that lets us know of baptism, of communion, and of being in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in you, O oh Lord. We thank you for all these gifts that you have given. Watch over us as a congregation as we look forward to where you want us to want to lead us. Let us see the where and give us the strength to follow where you want us to be. We pray that you will bless all of our meetings and all of our gatherings, but especially lifting up our voters meeting this day. In your name we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask, O oh Lord, that it will be with all of those who are sick, who are hurting, within this gathering of your people here at Berea. We lift up Lil, Delight, Millie, and Michael. We pray for Ruth, Sue, David, Heather, Terry, George, Larry, Esther, Jack, Catherine, Jeff, Esther, Andrew, Ladine, Leslie, Barb, Marv, Verb, and Agnes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the word given to us. We thank you, Lord, for the word shared amongst ourselves and to those that are around us. And we pray that you'll be with all of those who share that word throughout this world. We pray for our missionaries, for Chris, Josh, and Ruth, and their family. We pray for Lynn Henry as she goes on a mission trip coming up here to Ethiopia. Give them all safety. Watch over them as they share, as they learn, as they grow in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask that you would be with our friends, our families, all of those that you gather around us in our life. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will bless those that do not know you and work through us and work through those that more might hear and that those loved ones in our life may know the peace that passes all understanding. We pray for those that are sick and hurting, but especially we pray for Marilyn, Mark, Annette. We lift up John, Ted, Jennifer, Kyle, Anita, Steve, Mabel, Jean, Marlis, Debbie, Steve, Jackie, April, Amy, Jake, Doug, and Joe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we thank you for all your blessings, we thank you that you have made us and created us. We pray for all of those who celebrate their creation with their birthdays this week. As we pray for Linda, Karen, Joseph, and Nancy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And especially, Lord, we pray for our nation during this time of confusion and decisions. We ask, O oh Lord, for your mercy, for your care. We pray for all of our elected officials and ask that you would grant them a servant's heart. Give to them your wisdom and the strength to follow in your will. Especially, Lord, we pray for our president and vice president, for our Congress, Supreme Court, and judiciary, for our governor, for our legislature, and for all of our elected officials. And finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And we pray the words our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. Amen. We say together our closing hymn. Forth in the peace of Christ we go. We sing verse 1, 
three and five. Mm -hmm. 